the 20th century is the story of human ascent. The Wright brothers put man into the air, hitherto the domain of birds and angels. And then there were the mountaineers, intent on ascending into the rarefied realms, using nothing but their own hands and feet. In 1950, Maurice Herzog became the first human to go where none had gone before, at least not without an aeroplane, the 8,000 meter mark. The ascent of Annapurna was marked by great personal sacrifice, the toll the mountain exacted through severe frostbite. A few short years later, in 1953, a beekeeper from New Zealand and a Sherpa from Darjeeling became two of the most iconic figures of the century. The ascent of Everest gripped the world's imagination and made Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay household names. The impossible was suddenly achievable and nothing seemed beyond mankind's reach. Sputnik was orbiting the skies above and here down below, two men stood atop a mountain and straddled the globe. The 60s was the decade of Everest. In 1962, Mohan Singh Kohli, Hari Dang and Sonam Gyatso made it to a few hundred meters of the summit. In the process, they survived three benightments in the so-called death zone, above seven and a half thousand meters, two of them without oxygen. In 1965, the Indians, now led by Lieutenant Commander Mohan Singh Kohli of the Indian Navy, successfully placed nine men atop the summit. By the end of the decade, man stood on the moon and the floodgates were opened. Humanity was on the move. Junko Tabai became the first woman to climb Everest in 1975. Chris Bonington pioneered the hard way up philosophy and tackled Everest up the formidable southwest face. Reinhold Messner up the ante and did the north face in winter alone and without oxygen. In a few short years, the bar had indeed moved way up. Not that this deterred the multitudes. Tourism had exploded and in the Himalaya, what started as a trickle soon became a torrent and was well on its way to becoming a flood. Most of the Himalayan peaks were climbed in the 1950s and 1960s, but there were very few expeditions and no mountaineer ever thought of any problem arising on, uh, about environment, etc. But in the 1970s, uh, the situation, there was a big, big change in the scenario. Apart from the growing popularity of the Himalayas because of these major achievements, Air India started a very major global operation to promote trekking in the Himalayas. This happened because I had joined Air India on 1st of February 1971 and within few days I decided, I conceived the idea that to help Air India the best thing would be to introduce trekking in the Himalayas as a segment of, a segment of tourism. And so I was asked for five years after that to do nothing else except selling the Himalayas. And it went like a wildfire. There were about 10,000 people in the first year, 20,000 in the next year. It kept on multiplying geometrically. One of the main catalysts in this growth were mountaineering and tourism meets. The first of which was held in Darjeeling in 1973. This was probably the greatest single assemblage of mountaineering legends the world had ever seen. Participants ranged from John Hunt and Gurdayal Singh to Heinrich Harrer and Maurice Herzog. In 1975, 
I went to base camp on Mount Everest. Messner was also there in Namsi Bazar, so we both went round here and there. And that is for the first time I felt that the trekking trail to Mount Everest base camp was not clean. And, uh, but finally in 87, we felt that in fact articles started appearing from top mountaineers that the Amalias are in trouble. Captain Kohli was not the only one feeling the prickling of his conscience. As Sir Edmund was to write later, he felt immense guilt about the depredation unleashed in the Sola Kumbu region as a result of the Lukla airfield that he helped build. Similarly, Bonington was horrified at the high altitude rubbish dump that Everest was fast developing into, littered with the detritus of expeditions, made further unreal by the occasional corpse. Sir Edmund and I sat down and I said, Ed, I am feeling very guilty that I have been selling Amalia's left, right and centre during the past 17 years and today the Amalia's have become sick. He says, Moon, I am feeling the same. In fact, more than you, perhaps I have promoted the Amalia's by giving talks all over the world. So I think time has come when we should do something. The Himalayan Environment Trust was an idea whose time had come. With Captain Kohli taking the lead, the trust was formed in Hong Kong on the 14th of October 1989 with Sir Edmund Hillary as patron. Founding trustees included Sir Chris Bonington, Reinhold Messner, Morris Harzog and Junko Tabei. The Trust's first objective was to bring together the like-minded, and this proved easier than expected. Pioneering mountaineers from across the globe were appalled at what their conquests and explorations had wrought. The Trust, in the first few years of its inception, held a number of successful fundraisers and awareness meets across the globe. The result was a coming together of the mountaineering community and the first fruit was the evolution of the Himalayan Code of Conduct. Remember, somebody else will use the campsite after you. Please leave it cleaner than you found it. Reduce deforestation by making no open fires. Carry kerosene for all your heating and cooking needs. Burn dry packets, etc. Bury all biodegradable and food wastes and carry back all non-biodegradable litter. Go the extra mile and remove other rubbish you may come across as well. Keep local water sources clean. Camps must be situated at least 30 meters away. Do not wash directly in the stream or use detergents and site your toilet facilities well away and bury or cover all wastes. Educate your guides and porters in these measures. And finally, have respect for privacy, holy places and local cultural moors. It is a measure of how successful this code has been in permeating into the general consciousness that most of these elements are taken for granted today. For example, in the Kanchenjunga National Park, all expeditions and trekkers have to first show that they are carrying an adequate amount of kerosene before being granted entry. Lighting of open fires is strictly prohibited and well enforced. But besides creating awareness, the HET also wanted to actively work at the field level. So the Trust decided to start with the Gangotri region in the Garhwal Himalaya. 